Good evening, and welcome to this discussion on securing cloud-native applications. I'm Kamala Desika, your moderator. Uh, I focus on product marketing for our cloud platform and um, ISV ecosystem uh, at Pivotal. And what that means is I get to work with a great bunch of people, some great partners that help us broaden the value that we offer to our customers um, and help that digital transformation go just a little bit easier. Now, one of the things that comes up a lot in our discussions with our customers is how important security is to them, right? And this was also quite consistently brought up um, in the enterprise track where many of our customers spoke yesterday uh, and also today. So we thought it would be useful to share some of our experiences and our ideas um, with the broader community. And so today we have some uh, security-focused um, colleagues of mine out here with some of our security-focused partners uh, to have what's not necessarily a comprehensive uh, discussion given the time concerns, but at least we hope to leave you with some thought-provoking as well as some uh, actionable ideas for when we're back at work next week. So please join me in welcoming um, our panelists. I'll start with uh, Joe Granja. Do you want to start out with your introduction, your name, and where you work? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Granja, and uh, I've been building software for over 20 years. Time flies when you're having fun. And uh, mainly, the uh, um, financial services sector has been my focus in the Canadian market. Um, Toronto, actually. I'm based out of Toronto. Uh, worked with a lot of the big banks and the insurance, um, insurance industry, working with the inf InfoSec teams, making sure applications I was building on you know, are compliant with the security guidelines. Got to keep that closer. Um, in my current role, I'm actually a core committer within Spring, Spring Security, focusing on the, the new standards today, OAuth 2, OpenID Connect. Thanks, Joe. Uh, my name is John Field, and I'm a product manager working on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. I'm focused on security. I uh, like to tell people I've been doing security since long before it's fashionable. Uh, actually, the same as Joe here. Uh, came to Pivotal uh, by way of EMC and RSA CTO office, basically helping product teams improve their security architecture for a number of years, and been working on Cloud Foundry since about 2013. Um, before that, I did some time on uh, Bankers Trust on Wall Street, working in IT security and banking environment. And I like to say that that experience taught me everything I need to know about how to successfully get through a regulatory compliance audit. So hopefully we can share some of that today. Yes, you, you get through those by doing a lot of drinking. Um, <laughs> I'm Tyler Shields. I uh, run marketing strategy and partnerships for a security company called Signal Sciences based out of Los Angeles. I have spent the better part of two decades as well in, uh, in security, but uh, mostly on the breaking as opposed to the building side, uh, breaking applications, breaking into locations, et cetera. And then uh, uh, a number of years back, I switched over to actually building companies and helping build technologies and tools to help secure, uh, secure applications. And I'm also called Joe. I think I'll be Joe too on this uh, panel. Uh, so I work in the CTO office in Jamalto, focused on strategy. Uh, my background has been, I am the. I seem to be the baby because I'm only 15 years in security. Um, but it started with a long stint in a dark basement for government. And in the last five, six years, I've been working on the product uh, management, product development side in a number of vendor organizations. Perfect. Now, you guys are here on the panel today because each of you is focused on a specific layer in the application security stack. So could you tell us a little bit about what that is and where your work is currently focused? Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned, I'm uh, one of the committers on Spring Security, so my focus is application security. Uh, I'm just curious, just if I could get a raise of hands, who has heard of Spring Security or who has, who's used it? Great, okay. Um, I'll, I'll just do a quick high level um, for, for those of you that you haven't, is Spring Security is a, a you know, a application security framework for the Java platform, provides authentication, authorization capabilities, and integration to um, uh, identity systems, whether it's LDAP or SAML or OAuth, OpenID, so forth. Also provides uh, uh, protection against common vulnerabilities like cross-site request forgery, cross-site scripting, session fixation, et cetera. 
Uh, most of my efforts these days is, is focused on building out support for OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, as well as the Jose framework. So that's where my focus is today. Great. Thanks, Joe. And from my perspective, I'm focused mostly on Cloud Foundry platform, so Pivotal Cloud Foundry in the sense of kind of two things. I'm concerned about how do we manage to deliver a platform that makes it easy for the application developers to get through a regulatory compliance audit, right? What are your security and compliance requirements? And, and in practice, what does that mean? It comes down to working with Cloud Foundry product managers to make sure that the platform includes the technical controls that are necessary. And it also means working with customers to help those customers understand what's necessary for them to successfully get their applications through a compliance audit when those applications are hosted on Cloud Foundry. So uh, I also am at the application security layer, not necessarily at the auth layer like, uh, like the folks down on the end. Uh, I, my company focuses mostly on security visibility and security runtime security protection for applications uh, in this particular context for applications built in the, in the Cloud Foundry and, and Pivotal framework. Um, so we embed right into the heart of the application, either uh, as a plug-in to the web server itself or as a uh, library loaded into the, into the source code to provide security visibility and data and anomaly analytics, as well as runtime protection to your application. So I, I focus predominantly on that AppSec tier. So I'm at the other extreme uh, from the app guys. I'm right on the foundation layer. Um, when you, you think about the security that goes into applications, encryption, TLS, all of those kind of things, um, they're based on encryption keys. Those encryption keys get wrapped by other encryption keys. And effectively, the book stops with me and the, the products that Jamalto have such that you're not building a stack of turtles all the way down it comes to a foundation of what we call a hardware security module, which is effectively a vault, a brick that has been specifically security tested, that it can be truly considered to be the root uh, of the, the security model on which everything else in the platform is built. Great. So what would you say are some um, of the marketing market forces that are driving your work today? So maybe we can get that one started also with uh, Joe Granjo. Well, yeah, as as we've been seeing in this brave new world, right, this, this cloud native world where microservices live, right? I mean, that's totally changed the whole landscape of application security. You know, in the old way of doing things, the monolith, you know, let's say, let's use a concrete example. We've got a banking application, right? Online banking, retail, commercial, it's got 50 features, right? One application, we secure that, right? Now we decompose that application into, let's just say, five, 50 microservices. Now we have all these components, way bigger attack service. Now we've got to secure all these components instead of this one, right? So totally changes the landscape and super complex. How do we secure all these services, right? And it's the service to service interaction, what type of security protocols are we using? A mixture of combination security protocols. So it really, really drastically changes and really introduces complexity. Microservices are great. There's a lot of flexibility around it. But of course, it introduces complexity as well on the, on the security side of things. And how about you, John? Yeah, so I think Joe's points are basically all around application architecture, and I think that's kind of the first level. The, the thing that happens after that is the transformations we're seeing around DevOps and the move to cloud native from a process perspective. And I think what's important with security, the thing to understand, you know, is keep in mind, is that you can't talk about security of just the bits, right? That's important, but it's actually a combination of people and process and technology. And so that means that the technical bits are really only about a third of the problem. So I think we've been doing great in terms of adding new technical controls to the platform compared to where we were a couple of years back. The platform itself has got all of the necessary technical controls that you need. And from the people side, there's kind of no denying everyone is aware of security. The developers and operators I work with all want to do the right thing. We just have to kind of arm them with the education and training they need. Everybody is on the right track in that sense. From the process side, we've got a lot of work to do. All right. And I think what's happening is DevOps running into compliance is kind of like waterfall meets agile and they annihilate each other. Right? So I think there's work to be done there. And the key thing, kind of the one thing that I could suggest is that we have to think about 
really engaging early. So invite the compliance and security guys to the platform dojo, right? Instead of leaving them out of the loop, bring them in early. You know, early and often is definitely going to pay off in the long run. Tyler. So what's, what's shifting, I think, in, in the AppSec world that's causing um, a lot of change is definitely the, the DevOps, the Agile, and the cloud movements. I call it the three tectonic plates of change underneath security. And when you look at the actual, there's a, it does a lot of things to how we develop apps. It changes a lot of the processes. It changes a lot of the way things get done. But for me, the number one thing it changes is speed. Right, how quickly you can actually develop, how quickly you can put out no, new code, how quickly you can make changes to your code base, how many times you push into production a day. If we take the traditional static analysis, code analysis tools that have a turnaround of, of, let's say, I don't know, a day or two days to do a full code review for you before you push into production, that's fine when you're pushing into production once every six months. That fails when you're pushing into production 20 times a day. You can't do it. And so the fundamental biggest problem that security at the app layer is having is speed, at, at the speed of business and the speed of the technology that's now supporting that business. So the AppSec world really has to reinvent and put itself into a position where it can provide security, visibility, protection, knowledge uh, with feedback loops to the devs right, to educate the devs on how to do it right, but to do it in a way that's real time. And that, I think, is one of the biggest changes in, in market forces right now. So in my, in my area, I would say the biggest change is how the technology is consumed, ultimately, because um, hardware security modules, the kind of technology that we're talking about has been around since the 1990s. And if you look at what it looks like today and what it looked like right at the beginning in 1990, it's very similar. There's maybe a few tweaks here and there. Um, and so that whole methodology or expectation that you need a master's degree or a PhD to configure it, and it can take you a day, half a day to, to do something simple like add a new um, partition such that a new application can come on, on board. All of that goes out the window, as, as you say, when you're, you're pushing um, code out 20 times a day. And so the, the, the fact that these things are built into compliance, built into regulations, that you must use these kind of technologies, hits square into the, the DevOps culture of, okay, I've got to use it, so how can I use it quickly? And those kind of questions are, are being answered. That's great. Yeah, I, I think, you know, kind of Ed, what Joe is saying and, and Tyler, there, there's a concept, you know, what I like to think about from the point of view of the platform is the concept of inherited controls. And so everything that we're saying about the app's got to go faster and a lot of the technical controls that you need are in the platform, in the HSM that's uh, integrated with the platform. The idea then is that the apps go faster because they can benefit from the fact that the platform itself has been certified. Right? So the, the approach of security accreditation of the platform and then the apps that get deployed on top, you have a much smaller scope when you do that security and compliance assessment and therefore you can go faster. Opera it, it allows the operational components of those controls to actually operate much faster, too. So the compliance side is super important. But the ability, uh, if you take the traditional web app firewall where you stick a box out in front of your app, uh, what happens when you spin up a 1,000 apps in the cloud and you're putting these physical boxes in front of it, right? It just doesn't map and it doesn't work. So by embedding security into the heart of the application, whether it be at the HSM layer, whether it be at the, apps, at the app layer or at the host layer, embedding it right in the heart of the application gets it to run at the same speed, uh, metaphorically the same speed as the rest of the system itself. Right. Wow. So many questions uh, to follow up on, actually, from my end. <laughs> so uh, let me do a different one for each of you. Right. So I'll start with um, Joe Pindar, actually, this time. So one of the things that came up in all of your discussion is how much change there is. Now, what would you say are some areas of weakness in the, in the process and security models that enterprise already use? So it's... If you think about your own personal journey coming into Cloud Foundry and Cloud Native, um, you've had to ramp up, you've had to think about things in different ways. The, potentially the way that you learned at university how to develop apps isn't the way that you, you do it now. Now think about um, coming from a security background where you're not actually necessarily paying attention 
to all the developments that are in the space and what you know as, as um, just, it's natural to, to do a CF push, it's natural to have a pipeline of things. You have security professionals who are still thinking and have only just made a transition from physically separate servers that you can protect with a cage into a virtual environment. And now if you're starting to say, well, actually it's gone from that virtual machine to much more granular, it's not even containers, it's it's apps that you're just pushing and it's all orchestrated in there. It's more and more head spinning kind of steam out of the years. So I think that's it's something that, um, as was said, and getting security into the dojo, they don't, uh, security be, um, officers and, and people who are ultimately going to be signing off the compliance don't have to know everything about the platform and the way things work, but they have to know enough that when they apply it back to their first principles and what they've, they know uh, as the way things should work, they can actually answer the fundamental questions. And I think that's essential. Perfect. So my next one is for Tyler. So when trying to address those weaknesses that we just talked about, um, what would you say that enterprises would have to do to think differently in how they're investing their budget or um, you know, how they're protecting their applications? Well, I'll take the budget question first because this absolutely drives me insane. So I was an analyst prior to being a, um, uh, uh, um entrepreneur. Um, and as an analyst, we, we generated a lot of data. One piece of data was the actual uh, number and percentage of records that got breached via the application security layer. And the, the, it's by far the most uh, records compromised uh, come from the application security layer and things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and database, database breaches coming in from that direction. Yet only 5%, 5 to 10% of spend happens at the AppSec layer. So I totally don't get that mismatch, right? It makes no logical sense to me. And so that, that always used to drive me insane. But you know, I think uh, the biggest thing that has to change is actually making, well, not the biggest thing, because I think that the biggest thing has to change with education of people to, to get them to understand security inherently at the development level, because that's going to solve the problem at its root. But you know, in, in the short to midterm, the right way to handle that is to take care of it by putting in technologies in place that can apply security controls and feed back that data to the developer in a feedback loop. So it comes down to um, ownership in many ways. Uh, you know, One of the tenets of DevOps is actually that the developer owns both Dev and Ops, right? It's kind of one person responsible for the whole thing, beginning to end soup to nuts. Well, you know what? Security's in there too. So if your stuff gets popped, it's not necessarily on the security team at the end of the day, right? The developer has ownership of that code. Um, and so I think those are the key fundamental changes that are, that are occurring there at the people section, I think is gonna be the, that's the right way to solve it. But man, that's such an uphill battle. Right. So just in terms of a clean segue, maybe the next one is actually for Joe Granja. What would you say then is, uh, so if it's on the developers, what would you say then in, in terms of metrics or what sort of outcomes, technical outcomes, should they be looking at from a security perspective? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely been the general theme and I'm definitely riding on that theme is you got to you got to involve the security professionals with the engineering team right from the get go establish that relationship you know pair with them understand you know work with them to establish the security requirements for your microservices the bottom line is as a microservices team you own the security right now like you you have to make sure you have to ensure your microservice is secured Right, you, you, you work with the security people to um, establish your authorization rules. Right, especially, and this is a key one. Is and I'm not seeing this too much. Is write security focused integration tests. Now, if your service is only authorizing, you know, let's say you're, you're using OAuth and, and you got JWTs going, you know, being passed into your services, and you're only allowing Scope A and Scope B to to 
proceed through. Um, you got to have those negative tests. Forget about the, the positive tests. I mean, obviously, you got to have that, but you got to have as many negative tests. And the security professionals, they know how um, vulnerabilities, how attacks, you know, um, come in. They, they have that knowledge. So they'll be able to work with the engineers to build those, those test paths, those negative, those negative cases, right? So you have those tests, and ultimately, you'll have the metrics, right, through those tests that will be logged, that will ultimately come in, you know, come in handy at the end of it during the security audit and the final check before, before production, right? You said the magic word audit, so I thought that'd be like a perfect thing for, uh, okay, go yeah, for so it. Yeah, so something else to add to that too, guys, is it's a hell of a lot easier to teach a developer security than it is to teach a security guy to develop. Remember that, okay? You guys can learn how to attacks work because you understand the fundamentals of the code. You understand when a, when a tick mark comes in on an on a input field, you understand how that manipulates the actual SQL query, right? You can get to that level. It's so much harder to take a generic network pen test guy or somebody who's run firewalls and IDS systems at a, at a generic level from the security world and ex explain to them how development works. That's a whole other ball game. So own it and drag them kicking and screaming if you have to. And so I don't know how many uh, security people are in the audience that I just pissed off, but it's the truth of the matter, so. Yeah, actually, so yeah, to build on that, um, I think we need to do more threat modeling up front, right? So if you're a developer, seek out someone in your organization that is a security knowledgeable person and do some serious threat modeling before you start iterating. So if you actually understand what your requirements are, including the non-functional requirements, you might have reporting requirements, you might have availability requirements, right? Privacy, confidentiality requirements that you wouldn't otherwise have thought about, the security person will bring that to your attention. Together, as a balanced team, right? We talk at Pivotal a lot about balanced teams. Security and compliance is part of that balanced team. Understand those requirements, do the threat modeling, and having done that, you'll be much more successful in delivering rapidly a, an application that is actually secure and is capable of being compliant. So John, you, you mentioned the magic word compliance, and Joe, you mentioned the magic word audit. So what do you see, like what sort of advice can you give customers who want to deploy apps to PCF and are subject to a compliance audit? And op yeah. Yeah, so, you know, in addition to what I've said earlier about kind of people, process, and technology, I mean, I think that's a key thing. It's like the three-legged stool. It's people, process, and technology. The platform is just part of that problem. I think the thing that most people have trouble with is on the process side. And so, you know, engage with that audit team early and often so that they can begin to understand how the platform operates, right? The checkbox compliance approach is just not only not appropriate, it's not gonna ensure your security. It's actually better to get to the basis of why those checkboxes were created in the earlier generation and then deliver on what the actual requirement is. So there's three parts to showing you're compliant. It's actually be secure and demonstrate that you meet the technical control requirement. Then be able to show that you are secure by gathering the evidence that proves that. And I think doing that together is key. It has to be the deployed platform, right? You can't actually say that CF release is PCI compliant, right? It's just bits on a disk. CF release is just software. To make the, a, a statement about compliance or security, it's an actual running operating foundation and the surrounding people process and other technical controls that go with it. It's perfect. Uh, so we talked quite a bit about process change and, and, and some of the cultural aspects as well. Now before we go to the audience um, for their questions, yeah, it is that time almost already. Um, uh, it flies when you're having fun. So what are some key takeaways that uh, you have for them? Um, and what are maybe some gaps that they might be, uh, you know, they might need to be aware of? Maybe this time we'll start with Joe Pindar. So um, I think one of the key things uh, that I would take away is the fact that in emerging um, fields and emerging communities like um, DevOps, like um, Cloud Foundry, it's often easy to think we don't need no stinking compliance. We're pushing 20 times a day, so that, that's uh, fantastic. But the way that I, I would suggest you think about compliance is that it is the minimum entry criteria that a certain in industry has said that you have to meet this if you want to play in this environment. And so what that means is if you want to play in PCI uh, and 
payment cards, then you have to meet PCI compliance. So then it becomes a question, much like we've been talking uh, about on the panel, is so how am I going to do, meet that compliance? And so if you think about it as more of a, a hurdle rate to get into new markets, to expand the opportunity of what CF can deliver and take it to new audiences, I think that's a, a good mindset to, to take this forward. So from a compliance perspective, I just read somewhere recently that uh, the UK withdrew uh, a couple of their compliance specific rules or laws, or I don't remember what they were. And the reason they withdrew them is because it set a minimum bar that then gave people the permission to not exceed that minimum bar, right? Hey, I got my XYZ compliance cert, I'm good. I'm nice and safe. Well, guess what? A vast majority of the web breaches that occurred in the United States had PCI compliance, right? So that's not, that is totally the minimum and I definitely think that should be a takeaway. Um, from, from my point of view, uh, I'm not a huge compliance guy. I don't follow the space very much. It's not an area I tend to focus on. So from my point of view, I think the key for me is making sure that your processes and your people take control of the change that's occur occurring in your security realm. But really the key thing is getting tools that automate those people, because you're never going to have the right amount of people with the right skill set to be properly secure. You're just not going to. So get the right tools, and if you can embed them into the heart of the application itself and make them scale with the application and, and execute at runtime, you're able to keep up with the, the small changes, frequent deployment model that we now have to deal with. So for me, it's really looking at throwing away a lot of the tools and processes that we've had you know, for 20 years in AppSec. Well, AppSec's been around 15 or so, but in in the last 15 years, we've built up all these old static processes that just don't work anymore. So don't be afraid to throw them away, reinvent, just like we did with, with DevOps and Agile. We threw away a lot of old world development processes in favor of new techniques and new, new ways of doing, uh, doing development. Do the same thing with your security stuff. Throw away a lot of that old stuff and figure out how to do it in a, in a new way. So, so plus one to security automation, for sure. The whole idea that you can do things like static code scans, CVE scans, config scans, do those things in your pipeline for the very reason that that's the cheapest place to do it, right? There's, you know, adage about finding a bug before you ship. You know, it costs 10 times more to fix it after there's been a, a bug shipped. In this case, when we're talking cloud native, it's it costs way more after you've been breached and the data has actually been exfiltrated, right? So a small investment. Security is clearly pay me now or pay me later. And so an investment up front to say, I'm going to put those things in my pipeline, and then it's just part of every release. On the runtime side, I think in terms of investing in advanced detective controls. So rather than purely preventative controls, think about integrating with detective controls that are going to give you that feedback loop. Because the platform itself actually gives you all of the preventative controls, right? We've got all of those capabilities in the platform. Your application can rely on that. What you really want is to operate with detective controls at the application tier. Uh, yeah, key takeaways from the development side of things is do not write your own security framework or your own identity store. Don't do it. It's very difficult. It's very risky for your business. Um, not to mention maintaining vulnerabilities that are constantly being introduced. So don't do it. Um, leverage proven stable ones like Spring Security, for example. Um, leverage your, your internal organization's identity system. Uh, that's, that's the biggest one. Um, establish that relationship with the security professional. They're probably going to have a lot more fun working with you guys than sitting in their cubicles doing their security, you know, usual stuff. So engage with them, learn from them, because it's key in today's world, especially with this distributed architecture, security is, of, is even more critical these days. So learn, learn from them. And, uh, and this other one is a big one is, you know, this, this term, uh, adopt the approach of least privileged. What I mean is your, your service, you have authorization rules there, right? It author, it's, it's allowing requests to proceed based on scope A, scope B, for example. We'll, use, we'll drive on an example. Um, microservices do one simple thing. 
if all of a sudden you got 10 scopes in your authorization rules, you got to step back and you got to look, is that, does that service got to get decomposed into two services or do I got to remodel my authorization rules? The, the, the bottom line is, is keep things tight right from the get go. Only open it up a little as you're iterating on the development process, but don't open it up too much because then that's, that. I mean, it's just not safe. You just got to keep an eye out for that. Adopt the approach of least privilege. So that, those are the main key yeah. takeaways. Yeah, you, again, plus one. That's, it's much harder to pull it back after you've actually given too much than it is to incrementally add. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, start minimally. Think iteratively and start with the smallest possible scope and then actually go beyond that as you need to and in consultation with the folks who actually can help you in terms of things like what are the appropriate roles that exist in this app, right? Knowing that there are different roles. I think Joe wants to say something, Joe Pindar. So I, I just wanted to uh, cover something that uh, John and Tyler uh, touched on a little bit, is when you're, you're pushing back and saying, well, how do you actually do security in, in these new frameworks? One of the things that you'll find is that um, a lot of the security professional and the security auditors have been doing this for such a long time that they know how to take the shortcuts. And so they've forgotten what the, the principle is that they're trying to guard against. And they will say something silly like, um, you must have a, a static rule in a firewall to have an IP address to, to kind of prevent it this IP address from talking to that IP address. In a dynamic system, that makes no sense. What it comes down to is, can this application talk to that application? And so when you're pushing back on these um, security um, auditors uh, and the security organization, it's good to try and ask them, is that actually a shortcut that you've always done it that way? Or what is a, the first principle that you're actually working to? Perfect. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. Yes? I think y'all could probably hear me. So, so the question was, is there a role for the partners and other ISVs within the ecosystem to um, educate QSAs? Uh, yes, absolutely, and not just QSAs. Um, I think people like 18F have done a fantastic job educating internally within the US government, and we have equivalents in, in the UK. Uh, but it's for everyone from a security background coming into this space to, to champion the course, absolutely. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push back on, I, I have a question for you. What's the right way for us to do that, right? At the end of the day, we're, my, my company is, is intended to do two things. One, help the world become more secure. Two, make money, that's a business. What's the right way that we should engage with you? Obviously, you know, sending folks to conferences like this so that we can talk about the problems, doing training courses and things like that, I think are common, but it hasn't worked in 15 years. What, what can we do to do that better? Um, and you know, maybe that's a bit rhetorical, you don't have to answer, um, but... Yeah, please. Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing is it's, a, it's going to be a community effort. Folks like you who clearly, you know, you brought up OWASP, you clearly have an understanding of what some of these web attacks look like. You have some experience in the space. Folks like you and others in the community have to help champion it for each other as well, as well as every vendor. So totally with you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure the exact number, but my understanding is that it doesn't cost that much to join the PCI Standards Council. And so maybe what we do is we get a bunch of folks from this room and, and from the broader community to do that. Uh, I started a pivotal tracker, which was mapping every single PCI requirement into a tracker story. And then the idea is that you can demonstrate compliance on the platform by actually looking at the acceptance procedure that's there. So that speaks to the point of 
what is the essential security principle we're doing, like separation of duties, and here is a procedure you can follow to demonstrate that the platform actually does that. And so having those little tidbits or the way we educate those auditors and those QSAs kind of in an incremental way, and hopefully over the course of time, we get to the point where it, everyone agrees it makes sense to adjust what the standard stock says, right? The word container doesn't appear anywhere in PCI today, right? Yeah. So um, I have a question for all of you, which is, it sounded from some of the comments you were making that we needed to sort of involve the developer more. And the concern I have is we have this notion of a full stack developer versus somebody that's much more, if you like, focused narrowly. And so I'd, I would prefer it if the frameworks themselves provided a lot of the support that's necessary. Of course, you want people to have an awareness of security, but security is many faceted. It's everything from micro segmentation to things like uh, the actual attack surface if you're putting out a web app, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's so many different dimensions to it that it feels wrong to sort of, if you like, force the developer down that track versus actually have the platform have built-in circuit breakers. I'm thinking of things like AppSera, for example, which you know, can react far faster and deal with things uh, on, a, on a sort of platform basis versus having every developer have to understand and, and you know, program defensively, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the, from the point of view of full stack, I, I don't think there's any disagreement that it's important to understand the full, the full technology stack, including the security implications. Uh, I one time gave a talk about the full stack security developer and the idea that it doesn't make sense to not be a full stack developer because you really don't fully understand what you're deploying if you don't understand the full stack. But understanding it and having to actually build it are two different things, right? And I'm going to pass over to Joe here, who can explain you get the value from the framework, and you don't actually have to build it. You just have to know that it's being used properly. Yeah, like, like I was saying earlier, I mean, it's, it's been the common theme, right? Involving the security professional throughout the process right up front. Now, security professional is very specialized, right? Full stack developer, I mean, a lot of developers, they don't like security. Right, and, and, and they just, you know, not really focused on that, and that's okay, right? However, um, during the process, engaging that specialized, you know, the security, uh, the security professional, learning from them, you know, understanding at the very, the first step is understanding what are the security guidelines governing the organization from a high level at the very least. Learn from them, engage with them, um, pair with them. Now, the security professional, they don't have to understand writing code. That's why you got the stack, the, the full stack developer. But, you know, just engaging with them, understanding um, what, you know, what capabilities there are within the organization organization for authorizing their microservice, for authenticating with their microservice and so forth, building those integration tests, those security focused integration tests. With the combination of those two, you could achieve that. Full stack de developer does not need to specialize in security because that takes that takes quite a, it's, it's complicated, right? But that's why you got the specialists there tag teaming with the engineers, right? I think Joe's next. So what you're advocating, Joe Granja, is DevOps empathy. For, with security professional and your DevOps professionals. Yeah. So I, I'm going to push back on this concept of um, security and the full stack developer because for every full stack developer, I see 10 junior developers who don't know how to do the full stack. But let's say there is a junior developer doing front end web app work and they need to receive um, external uh, or human input into that web app. So they have some, uh, some entry fields. Now, absolutely, as part of their general education of how you do a nice web form on, on the front end and how you make it look pretty, they should know about SQL injections and the way that um, people are actually attacking those kind of forms. So yes, there is a full stack, and that can get very complicated, but on a, a very simple level on a just doing the, the front end interface, there are security things that you've got to think about that frameworks can help you with, absolutely. But I think that's something that everyone from the most junior person up, as soon as you put an input form on a web page, you should be thinking about security. Security can be automated throughout that stack in many different places, many different layers, in many different ways, and that's awesome. 
that's the dream so that it's a self-securing system and definitely put those tools, use those frameworks, et cetera. But how do you automate the security of a multi-step process that was designed incorrectly by the coder that doesn't have an input field that you're manipulating, but literally if you go down a certain path of, of input, you're able to do something that wasn't originally intended. Those are called uh, you know, multi-step process flaws or, or business logic flaws, right? Those, those aren't anything that a, a framework is going to be able to solve for. They're, un, they're unique snowflakes to that particular application. So my point of bringing that up is put in the best strong frameworks. Use, use uh, Cloud Foundry and Pivotal to you know, erase, recycle, reuse all the Rs and, and have it build up, uh, you know, killing off the, uh, the, the constant, um, uh, the persistent threats that may get in, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you still have custom code that sits on top of that. And application layer attacks, when I, when I was breaking systems, I, we, we, we had a running joke. If you found a cross-site scripting, people would laugh at you because they're a dime a dozen, they're throughout the system. Now the, some of the frameworks fix them, whatever. The real fun vulns when we were breaking systems was finding those multi-step process flaws that the developer put in. That was like, oh man, that was a good find. And at the end of the day, those are the hardest ones to, to solve. So I think the answer still has to be education for that full stack developer to look at his own code. Uh, he has ownership and responsibility of that code, but definitely rely on underlying tools to help automate whatever can be automated. Perfect. We are very much over time, and I think uh, no one has left the room, so that's awesome. <laughs> so we must have had a really good discussion. So I would like to thank the audience for their time, as well as our, um, our guests and our panelists today. So a big thank you for staying over. We will still be around if you guys have individual questions to ask them, but I do believe we have to leave the room soon. Sorry.